Hello and welcome to this special edition of the India and the World webinar. I'm Srinath Raghun, a non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie India. This is the 13th edition of the India and the World webinar and your host usually, Professor Rudra Chaudhary, is today one of our guests. And today we're going to be talking about the India-Pakistan ceasefire agreement of 25th February. In a joint statement last week, India and Pakistan reaffirmed their commitment to the 2003 ceasefire agreement. This comes in the wake of increasing violations and regular exchanges of fire between Indian and Pakistani troops along the line of control and the international border. The announcement followed a rare conversation between the director generals of military operations of both Indian and Pakistani armies over the established military hotline. Can India and Pakistan translate their stated intentions for mutual beneficial peace into reality? If so, how can the agreement be viewed in a wider geopolitical context? To examine the implications of the recent ceasefire announcement on the future of India-Pakistan ties, we are delighted to have with us today Ambassador TCA Raghavan, Lieutenant General Retired DS Huda, and Ms. Indrani Pakchi, as well as Rudra Chaudhary. Before we plunge into the conversation, I'd like to briefly introduce our distinguished speakers. Ambassador TCA Raghavan is a Director General of the Indian Council of World Affairs. He retired from the Indian Foreign Service in December 2015 while serving as Indian High Commissioner to Pakistan. Pakistan is also a country that he has dealt with extensively over his diplomatic career. Ambassador Raghavan has a PhD in Economic History of India from the Jawaharlal Nehru University. And in his retirement, he has turned extensively to the writing of history, strategic analysis, diplomatic and intellectual trends uh, in the making of modern India. His most recent book, Attendant Lords, Bairam Khan and Abdul Rahim, Courtiers and Poets in Mughal India, was awarded the Muhammad Habib Memorial Prize by the Indian History Congress. He has also written uh, the widely received The People Next Door, The Curious History of India's Relations with Pakistan, and History Men, Jadnath Sarkar, G.S. Sarkisai, Raghubir Singh, and their quest for India's past. Lieutenant General D.S. Huda is a former General Officer Commanding-in-Chief of the Indian Army's Northern Command, a Senior Fellow for Military Strategy at the Delhi Policy Group, and a Co-Founder of the Council for Defense and Strategy. Council for Strategic and Defense Research. As Northern Army Commander and during his stellar career in the Indian Army, General Hudda handled numerous strategic challenges along the borders with both Pakistan and China. He was Army Commander during the Tumor incident along the LAC with China in 2014 and during the launch of the surgical strikes in September 2016. Indrani Bakchi, who will be joining us in a short while, is the diplomatic editor of the Times of India where she covers daily news on foreign affairs, interprets and analyzes global trends from an Indian perspective. She joined the Times of India group in 2004, prior to which she was an associate editor for India Today. Uh, she graduated from Loreto College, Calcutta University, has been a Reuters Fellow at Oxford, a Chin Lincoln Fellowship of the Asia Foundation, study US-China relations at Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And she's also a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. As I mentioned, Indrani will be joining us shortly. And last but not least, our guest today is usually your host for this program, Dr. Rudra Chaudhary, who is the director of Carnegie India. His primary research focuses on diplomatic history of South Asia and contemporary security issues. At present, he is heading a major research project that involves mapping and analyzing violent incidents and infrastructure development on and across India's borders, along with his team at Carnegie India. Dr. Chaudhary will be getting us off the ground with a short presentation of this very important research. So in a sense, this is really a curtain raiser for uh, much of the work which is to come, which will put the current developments along the line of control in context, both in strategic, political, diplomatic, as well as a quantitative context uh, through the extraordinary data collection effort that they have done. Gudro, uh, may I request you to please get us started? Uh, uh, thanks, Srinath. It's, it's a pleasure to be uh, on this uh, seminar. Um, I'm just going to provide a brief introduction to what we're calling the ceasefire project uh, before I go into some of the larger findings. Um, this is just a kind of a brief peek into um, what our data suggests. And um, just for the audience there, Srinath and I were chatting and we thought it might be a good way to provide a framework to deal with some of the more immediate matters arising out of the reaffirmation of the ceasefire agreement um, in, um, 
more recently. Uh, so just to give you a very brief account, it was in 2016 with the surgical strikes, and it's, it's wonderful and a privilege to have Lieutenant General Huda with us um, in this seminar. Um, it was on the back of the surgical strikes that um, many of us asked ourselves is, you know, how often do these incidents take place? Uh, what is the basic spread of violence on the line of control as well as the international boundary? And we realized that apart from data that is made available in two or three sources, uh, both very good, um, methodologically, our view was that there is more to be done with open source data. Um, so essentially, we got a team, a team of uh, young researchers. And I should just, you know, uh, you know, kind of just lay out that this was an incredible effort uh, done by about 15 researchers who's worked on this project for the last four to five years in different parts of the world, but led primarily by Surya Veliapan, Shreya Shinde, and Raghuveer Nidumolu, who really deserve some attention. We'll be doing a formal launch of this dashboard and project sometime in the summer, but we just thought we'll give you a sneak peek here. Um, the methodology was quite simple. So this project is going to be morphed into an interactive dashboard, which will be completely open source and people from around the world can use it as you like. Um, and as I said, it's open source. So what we essentially did was we chose five newspapers in Pakistan, both vernacular and English, five newspapers in India, vernacular, English, as well as from JNK. Um, and essentially the team looked at 21 data points per day per newspaper from the 1st of January, 2004 to the present. Uh, they're in the process of completing the 2020 data, which will be updated shortly. Um, now, what we did in this essential process is that we kept it pretty forensic. So we had a different team of people doing the Pakistani newspapers, and we had a different team of people doing the Indian newspapers. And I'll explain in a bit why that actually is quite, an, you know, why that is important um, to keep in mind. We also made sure that we followed a methodology where we avoided any amount of double counting. Um, what we were able to glean is essentially, we looked at a range of what we call contextual factors that have been cited by scholars, academics, and practitioners as the primary reason for ceasefire violations. So this could be have to do with uh, bilateral uh, talks between India, Pakistan, military exercises, meetings at the sidelines of the UNGA, riots in Jammu and Kashmir, cricket matches even, appointment of major um, um, military figures on both sides, regimental changes, and so on. So the whole idea was to provide the user, essentially you, the ability to cross-check ceasefire incidents on the one hand against these various contextual factors and come to your own conclusion with regards to what is it that leads to the, see, the ceasefire incidents um, in the first place. Now, just by way of um, framework, it's, I think, worth having a look at this data sheet for a couple of minutes. Um, the first disclaimer I should add is that we started the project on 1st of Jan 2004. And, you know, and hence we start at a place where there is a huge redu reduction in incidents compared to the years before that. And that's worth keeping in mind. Number two, and essentially this is not surprising to us, but these are the, the primary kind of data points for ceasefire incidents that's available at the moment. Uh, we call our project the ceasefire project, but there's a fantastic resource run by Happy Moon Jacob at Jawala Nehru University called the Indo-Pak Conflict Monitor. There's of course the South Asia Terrorism Portal. And then where possible, we've added the government data as announced by the government, either in parliament or in different forms. Now, clearly what you see is that there is a delta between the government's reported data, as well as the data that we have, which is roundabout kind of ballpark, similar to what the Indo-Pak Conflict Monitor comes up with. So essentially, it's important to keep in mind as a disclaimer, that what we are representing here, I would say, is anything between 10 and 25% of what's actually happening. And that's primarily because it's reported data. For methodological reasons, we needed a stable set of sources to be able to make assessments and estimates for the last 17 or 18 years. Hence, we've kept the government data outside of the metrics of the dashboard. But I think this framework and um, perspective is worth certainly keeping in mind. Um, this is essentially what the dashboard looks like. So this is kind of uh, my 60 second PR campaign, if you like. There's a lot that you can do with it. You can go down to the month level, you can go to the yearly level, you can look at the entire dashboard, and it gives you a breakdown of incidents, of fatalities, of casualties. Um, and then as you see this particular slide in the bottom, 
you can cross check it with a variety of contextual factors. So if your hypothesis is that during the time of military exercises, ceasefire incidents increase, um, you can check that immediately in a matter of minutes on the dashboard, the tip of your fingers. If your hypothesis is that terrorist actions or activities or incidents in India correlate with an increase in ceasefire incidents, you can do that. Um, you can do that just as easily. Um, so this is just the kind of dashboard. Now, very quickly, you know, moving to why this is important, perhaps for the current debate. Um, this is essentially the first big finding. The blue line that you see is reported incidents from India. The green line is reported incidents from Pakistan. And I think um, the first big finding for us, and anecdotally, of course, this is well known, but statistically, I think it is now backed up, which is that the equation is quite simple, which is that when both sides engage in dialogue or when there is a thaw in the relationship, violence on the line of control comes down. And that is absolutely clear in the findings that we have over here. Um, and it's just and anecdotally, if we speak to most practitioners, this is exactly what they'll tell you, but we think that there's some merit in having it backed by data. The second important thing which we found interesting is that although we are only using reported data, and, and here I come back to although that, you know, that we had a forensic sort of approach to this, where we had a different set of people doing India and a different set of people doing Pakistan, the Indian and Pakistani data actually mimic each other, which we thought was quite interesting. They almost mirrored each other. Difference is only in scale, but the large pattern is more or less the same. Um, so that perhaps provides some degree of veracity to the project itself. Um, what are some of the very quick other findings is often there is an assumption that it was when the NDA or the BJP government came in in 2014 that incidents increased. Actually, what the data shows us is that that's not necessarily true, that the rails had kind of, kind of gone weak come 2011, 2012, when the dialogue process, of course, had been long frozen after the Mumbai attacks, but incidents started peaking in 2013. And if you look at just this graph between 2014 and 2016, or the middle half of 2016, is you actually see an ebb and flow, which can almost follow the um, government's approach to Pakistan um, in those very telling first two, two and a half years. And then, of course, come the summer of 2016, when you had a huge number of attacks in Jammu and Kashmir, followed by the incidents in Uri, you see a kind of complete uptick in the violence levels, which just keeps kind of spiraling upwards. Um, these are the, so these are the kind of, um, some of the other things that you can glean from the data is um, fatalities data, for instance. And here, what we found interesting, and again, it's not necessarily surprising. There's a part of the dashboard week where you can discern the kind of weapons that is used on the LOC. Obviously, when there is higher use of mortar or sometimes artillery, the levels of fatalities are very high. What we found quite interestingly, and again, unsurprisingly, is that in the Pakistani reported data, civilian incidents are the highest counted. Um, and that's primarily our assumption through interviews is that a lot of this data is filtered through the ISPR inside of Pakistan. So what the Indian side might call a militant fatality is usually branded as a civilian fatality on the Pakistani side. And on the Indian side, what shows is that military fatalities are at the are at the highest level in terms of reported data. La and just two more points is what we found, which was interesting in the data is the type of incident. Now there's been some amount of debate in this in some circles is that what is the primary incident type that defines the ceasefire incidents on both sides? I think there is an overwhelming view that it is infiltration cover fire for militants coming across the line of control or the um, international boundary, or largely the line of control. Um, but actually what the reported data shows is that that's not true. It shows very clearly that this is state on state action. Infiltration is um, in fact, the second type of incident that drives this, which is I think in a way and ironically a positive one, which means that essentially there is greater political control clearly of, in terms of you know controlling the heat on the thermometer um, of violence between um, between the two sides across the LOC. And lastly, and I'll end here, Srinath, is we've um, just kind of put some data together, which is again available in a much snazzier kind of way on the dashboard, which is the geographical spread of violence. There is, in some quarters, there is a view that the geographical spread has moved from the north to south, 
from the LOC to the IB. Um, we actually find that that's not necessarily true. There are cyclical periods in the year where the IB goes live, as you can see in this particular graph, but the intensity of the violence and incidents are primarily still in the and on across the LOC, especially in the Jammu sector. So in areas like Poonch or Joli, et cetera, which is amply clear in this particular. So that hence the thesis that if, act, so there's a thesis which suggests at the moment that if actions take place in the IB, it showcases a certain degree of escalation between India and Pakistan. Our data actually doesn't necessarily show that that is true. But in the end, I'll just say is that, you know, just coming back to a point that we anecdotally, many of us who watch this area will know, um, but I think it's worth reinforcing is that the data on India-Pakistan is absolutely clear, is that when both sides engage in each other in dialogue, in discussion, levels of violence come down. I'll end here. Thank you, Srinath. Thanks, Rudy. And uh, I think you've whetted everyone's appetite for seeing the actual dashboard. which I'm sure we'll have a <laughs> chance to do a deep dive. But um, perhaps uh, I could turn to General Huda and, uh, sir, request you to just maybe talk a little bit about this headline claim which the data here is making, which is that patterns of violence along the LOC are fundamentally correlated to the political sort of temperature between the two sides. And in, in some ways, it is not what you would imagine as operational factors or more localized contextual things, tit for tat, reciprocal sort of steps taken at operational tactical level, but something which is kind of very closely related to the political trends. I mean, does that map with your experience of uh, you know, functioning in uh, the areas along the line of control. I mean, is, is that the way that you would read the developments over the past many years? So, Srinath, I think there are there are two factors. Uh, one certainly is political factor, and I'll come to that. But I think it's also related to uh, violent incidents uh, on the line of control, where the army gets directly targeted. Okay, let me explain this. So, uh, in the dashboard, we saw that suddenly in 2013, there was a big spike during the, during the UPA time. Uh, if we look at the incidents of 2013, 2013 began with 8th January, uh, the beheading of uh, Hemraj. Then you saw uh, in, in, I think it was in July in Punch sector where we lost uh, five soldiers uh, in an ambush on the line of control. Uh, there were many incidents of IDs being planted at uh, you know, forward areas, uh, patrols, uh, you know, uh, people on patrolling getting injured or, you know, suffering a fatal casualty. So certainly uh, violence along the line of control, uh, not so much in the hinterland. So le let me just sort of again, what happens uh, in the hinterland in Kashmir doesn't uh, to, to a direct extent, uh, you know, impact what is happening on the line of control. What is happening on the line of control? And then... Uh, you know, there's a feeling that uh, it, Indian Army only reacts to incidents that are happening. That's not true. So if you have, uh, you know, deaths and casualties along the border, uh, one reaction is uh, some retribution must also go to the Pakistan Army, which is, uh, you know, pushing in infiltrators and, and doing all this. So uh, one is incidents along the line of control, and, and that uh, actually impacts on, on ceasefire uh, violations that are happening and so you could you could see uh, deaths on the border and try and correlate that with uh, the increase in ceasefire violation the other thing for sure is is political factor uh, when there is uh, you know agreements on both sides uh, and there is there is bonhomie there is talk about you know calming things down certainly it will impact uh, one and not only from uh, when I'm saying political factors, not only from the Indian side. One more reason, and I was personally there in 2013. One more reason for a spike in ceasefire violations, and I I firmly believe this to be true, was political as factors on the Pakistani side. So you recall 2013 was the election year in Pakistan, and Nawaz Sharif was making some you know very positive kind of statements about relationships with India. Uh, and we were surprised uh, the minute the election results were announced and Nawaz Sharif was sort of announced as the prime minister, suddenly there was a spike in firing from the Pakistani side. So certainly political factors, uh, you know, do play a role. 
and even on our side yes uh, if you if, if you have sort of political rhetoric coming out that you know this is this is how we want to deal with pakistan there are no talks which are going on certainly for sure you will see a spike in ceasefire violation thank you sir uh, ambassador raghun can i bring you on exactly to the point that uh, general huda sort of left us off just to say that you know when we are thinking about the state of diplomatic relations between india and pakistan in the pakistani context uh, there is of course the whole question of civil military relationship what the role of the army vis a vis the elected political leadership is in terms of the way that the state wants to deal with uh, so i was just wondering whether in your experience extensive experience which i should say goes back to at least several decades of, of dealing with pakistan of course as high commissioner Uh, towards the end of a career, I mean, did you see this dynamic playing out also and mapping on to the way that say things happen along the line of control? Thank you, thank you, Carnegie India for inviting me. And I would tend to agree with uh, General Huda that the LOC is a thermometer or a barometer of uh, many things, and certainly the overall state of the relationship is one. But in my experience, I found that it is also a kind of barometer of what is happening inside pakistan in terms of uh, uh, civil military uh, relations uh, and certainly the spike in 2013 uh, had a great deal to do with uh, nawaz sharif's uh, uh, return and one shouldn't forget at the end of 2013 there's a sudden drop uh, because uh, there was a meeting of the dgmos and the heads of the uh, border security force and the rangers uh, to address uh, just this uh, issue but 2015 16 were also years which we now know in retrospect are intensified civil military uh, strife in uh, pakistan uh, and the fact that political initiatives taken that time at that time uh, on the india pakistan front didn't work is perhaps not so surprising because it was coming up against this uh, domestic factor and certainly 2016 2017 it's reflected very very directly Uh, in terms of what is happening on the uh, on the line of uh, control so so yes uh, i think there are multiple factors at play and i don't think we should underestimate the internal dynamic in pakistan in terms of a direct bearing it has ha- that it has on the uh, on the line of control possibly it operates uh, as general huda suggested on the indian case too but i think less uh, uh, less directly Uh, and one must uh, also take into account the fact that uh, a ceasefire the loc getting active uh, has much more uh, implications uh, uh, in terms of the impact on popular psyche in pakistan than it has in india uh, simply because of the the size of the the different sizes of the two uh, countries so i would say the internal factor is also very significant shinat you are on mute so if you were to look at this current development the uh, the latest sort of joint statement which has happened now clearly this is not the first time that india and pakistan have announced a ceasefire uh, you know the, the first ceasefire was announced on 1st of january 1949 we've had several such announcements and each of those has had a certain context so i mean stepping back how would you read the current diplomatic context what do you think are the considerations in play on both sides which has enabled this joint statement which is something of an improvement on previous the, the last round of 2003 when more or less both sides agreed that they would follow similar sets of protocols rather than coming together and announcing something jointly so i'm just wondering what do you think is happening on the diplomatic front which has enabled this particular development uh, of uh, this moment to my mind most both countries have uh, come to the uh, conclusion that it is not in their in, uh, national interest uh, for this uh, uh, status quo at a very low uh, plateau uh, to continue uh, i think both realize that there's these tactical skirmishes on the loc for a start uh, are uh, don't really help uh, in any uh, way that they look upon either their bilateral relations or the rest of uh, their relations with other countries in the world i think this this understanding has come about that you know it's time to break this uh, uh, impasse and so i think that is the 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 most significant uh, reason and uh, it's not surprising that this uh, kind of conclusion has been 
arrived at by both sides because India and Pakistan, historically their relations have followed a certain cyclical uh, pattern. So while it is true that the last four or four and a half years have seen a pretty uh, uh, bad state uh, or in terms of bilateral relations, in, in whatever way you uh, measure it, but it's easy to overlook the fact that this very bad phase in India-Pakistan relations is, also, is bookended by two very significant developments, both of which were very uh, positive. Uh, the first of them was Prime Minister Modi uh, going to Lahore, uh, dropping in on a social function at Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's residence. And the second is uh, the opening of the Kartarpur Saab corridor in the, at the end of 2019, after everything has happened, after August 2019, after Balakot, after Pulwama, everything. So it shows that you know India-Pakistan relations is a uh, is a odd kind of creature because there are these two contradictory impulses which operate all the time, uh, and it's a question really of which impulse gains the upper hand at a particular point of time. Then, Buddha, uh, would you agree that there is also a military strategic kind of context to what is happening? I mean, is it a coincidence that this agreement has been agreed upon just on the back of this long standoff that we've had? on the line of actual control with China? So I think, uh, as Ambassador Raghavan is saying, I think there is, uh, you know, the, there are larger elements at, uh, at play here. And uh, as he said, uh, you know, uh, the enduring hostility, what's happening along the borders, is really not serving strategic ends of either uh, India or of, or of Pakistan. So Pakistan has made, uh, you know, attempts to internationalize the Kashmir issue. Uh, they hoped that, uh, you know, the August 9th decision would bring about greater violence and some kind of insurrection in Kashmir. So all that has not happened. In fact, they've just lost their friends, you know, uh, by trying to internationalize this. Uh, you see what, what's happening with Saudi Arabia and UAE, etc. Uh, and certainly on the Indian side, I think, uh, you know, the threat from China, uh, which is now sort of open and overt along the northern borders, uh, would have brought in some realization that having two very active frontiers uh, does not serve our, our interests either. Uh, so I'm not saying it's only the China sort of uh, equation that is that has brought this agreement about, but certainly there is an element that, uh, you know, uh, would have been under consideration. Uh, suddenly there is talk about a two-front threat. Uh, suddenly there is talk about, uh, you know, realigning uh, resources from the Western border to the northern border against against China uh, and and to be to be absolutely frank I mean the, the defense budget is what it is so I think it's a it's also a reality check that uh, you know uh, is this the best way that we are going about uh, or do we need to take a you know slightly balanced long-term view to how we deal with our with our neighbors particularly Pakistan so I, I think those uh, the larger picture would have a have a much greater weightage in how decisions have been arrived at, and and the the particular process through which it was arrived at. I mean, uh, do you think the militaries on both sides? Uh, obviously, the Pakistani army would have been much more in the driver's seat, so to speak. But clearly, the DGMO spoke, and then you know the agreement has been inked, so to speak. So, so you know, Shriyant, my uh, my sense is uh, that I'm 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 fairly sort of hopeful. And as the Ambassador Agwin also pointed out, if the Pakistan military and the political leadership is not sort of in sync, then the success of the of any agreement that you have on the borders uh, is only going to be limited. It does appear that this time that both the military and the political leadership have in Pakistan arrived at some kind of uh, consensus. Uh, and therefore, at least in the short term, hopes of the ceasefire agreement holding to me are, are, are larger. Would it have been decided at the DGMO level? Certainly not. I mean, these are political decisions that would have been taken. I think the reason why it was announced as a DGMO's agreement was probably this is the only sort of official channel that is open today between India and Pakistan. That despite everything, the two DGMOs are meant to talk to each other every Tuesday. I mean, that's the, uh, the, the DGMO head, hotline gets activated every Tuesday. So uh, it, it's a channel that is open. And so it would be a good thing rather than sort of, you know, announcing it politically. 
to announce it through an existing mechanism but but certainly the decision i i think is at at a much higher level indrani welcome sorry we got started off without you but i did introduce you so great to have you here with us uh, so indrani just to carry the conversation forward could you try and see what could you place this recent development which has been something of a surprise in a broader geopolitical context i'm just thinking you know from the pakistani perspective there is the looming sort of end game in afghanistan uh you know the india and china have been sort of at loggerheads as you know the sort of uh, mentioned that must have been sort of at the back of minds certainly the united states under donald trump used to periodically make noises about wanting to mediate and so on without perhaps there being any real teeth to it but nevertheless you know there is a new administration which perhaps has different priorities so i'm just wondering you know what is the broader context within which we should read it? of course we shouldn't read too much into anything but i was just wondering given your uh you know the vantage point from which you sort of think and report about these things where do you see the jigsaw puzzle dani i think you're on mute yeah 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 um yeah uh, thank you uh, shrinath and apologies for uh, joining in late um so my sense is and i agree with uh, uh, both uh, tca and uh, general huda that this was not a, a decision taken at the dgmos level uh, i think primarily um india wants a needs a calmer periphery at the point, at this moment um i don't think it serves um, india's purpose to keep uh um a, conf a conflict uh, on simmer on the western front and on a uh, on medium high heat uh, uh, on the northern front i don't think it serves uh, india's purpose um the larger geopolitical question and i think you um spoke about afghanistan i think afghanistan uh, not just afghanistan's future but the but the steps that a, a biden administration might be tempted to take uh, to uh, get a resolution uh, whatever that resolution may be um, i think would have played a role as well uh, i from my uh, perspective i see that the indian government uh, their attempt and to keeping this ceasefire agreement in view is a way of also preempting any desire that a us administration might have to uh, get into the india pakistan uh, dynamic uh, before an afghanistan deal is done and by preempting it india retains the uh, ability to direct the the to to direct the flow of events or the flow of uh, maybe dialogue maybe not but india remains in the driving seat by taking this uh, step uh, i india is not uh, does not want the us to be able to drive that particular uh, cart and i think that may have played uh, a role in where we are today Thanks. Uh, Rudra, can I bring you on the US angle as well, since that's something that you kind of looked at in the long durée, so to speak. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, is it fair to say that, you know, the US role vis-a-vis -vis India-Pakistan has definitely shifted over the past decade or so, or perhaps a little bit more? I mean, for instance, you know, in 2016, subsequently in 2019, we saw that, you know, whenever India has taken proactive steps to retaliate against terrorist attacks, you know, the international context has been much more sort of accommodative, so to speak. and understand rather than coming down on some kind of a you know even handed so to speak stance and that perhaps carves out a different kind of posture for us as well the way that we deal with that yeah no thanks uh, shrinat so you know on just two points so one is i think on what um, indrani said which is that you know perhaps at some outer level there was this thinking that taking the initiative now before a new us administration settles into those various posts following various senate confirmations um actually does well to not deter but certainly to send a very clear message to say is that you know these are issues and troubles that largely can be dealt with bilaterally and um on the you know on the turf of both india and pakistan and i think that's actually a very important message 
Now, interesting thing about deterrence, of course, is you don't know who you're deterring. So whether or not the US administration actually wants to sort of come in play over here or whether Biden actually turns out to be more like President Johnson than he does than, than say, President Clinton is yet to be seen. My own sense is it'll be more Clintonian than it'll be Johnsonian. Um, but I think the, the fact that the government preempted this, as Indrani said, and kind of sent that message, um, I think will kind of set the framework when principles meet in the near future at various different levels. The second is on the, you know, on your question of the changing disposition of the US government. Jinat, my assumption is 2016 to 19 is a tough year to abstract away as a conventional kind of approach that the US may take. There was nothing conventional, of course, about the Trump administration and their approach to these issues. Um, but by and large, my sense is that, you know, what we've seen in the United States is that when the onus is squarely placed on Pakistan uh, with regards to clear evidence that a terrorist attack or a major incidence is tracked back to Pakistan is interestingly, I think what we've seen is the US government taking a more, from what in India we would see as a more accommodative step uh, with regards to retaliation. Having said that, I'm not quite sure that under the Biden administration, people like Jake Sullivan in the seat, Anthony Blinken and others, um, that that will necessarily kind of be the case down the line. And I think that will kind of be, be, be yet to be seen uh, primarily because of the escalatory nature um, and the changing geopolitics of our time. But if I may, you know, at some point, could I pose one question is um, just following Ambassador Raghavan and General Huda's view, there seems to be, you know, when we look at the rationale behind the ceasefire uh, reaffirmation, there's the role of the US, there's geopolitics, defense expenditures, the current state of the economy in Pakistan, the long standoff with China, you know, the idea to avert a two front kind of crises. But I was just wondering, and perhaps to Ambassador Raghavan, is there something to be said that there is a basic political instinct on the part of the Indian prime minister that stability and peace with Pakistan is very much in our, in, in our interest. I mean, it's, um, as you know better than I, sir, I mean, in the first two and a half years, he did many surprising things with regards to Pakistan. So I just wonder is that, is there a basic ingrained political instinct that, um, that despite everything, um, it will be tough, you know, it will be tough on Pakistan, obviously if Pakistan's tough on us with regards to terrorist attacks and uh, retaliations, et cetera. But when there is an opportunity, the idea should be to grab it. I would say yes. And I would also say that it's not just in, in India. There is a similar uh, impulse uh, in Pakistan too. And, uh, you know, every, I mean, this is something which is discussed all the time that if you, you keep repeating the same steps, thinking it will have uh, uh, a different outcome and it's a form of uh, lunacy. Uh, and this view that nothing is going to come out of your doing anything with Pakistan goes back to the early 50s and mid 50s with Krishna Menon and uh, many others. But despite that, this view has always been there periodically that you have to do something. And as I said, it has been there in Pakistan too. And my simple answer is that you don't become prime minister of India or for that matter, uh, prime minister or whatever in Pakistan uh, to do small things. You want to do big things. Uh, and uh, certainly while these other factors, the US, uh, the situation with China, all have a bearing on the uh, on the uh, situation. But I think those are the additional tipping factors. But I think that inclination that, you know, this present situation is not in our interest. We have to do something. We are in the midst of a uh, pandemic. Because it's interesting if you see some of the uh, sentences which are there in the Prime Minister's uh, uh, speech when he spoke to uh, health officials from different uh, countries. And it was not a SARC meeting, but still Pakistan attended. Some of the sen sentences in that uh, suggest this uh, wider concern about uh, South Asia. And I do think we have to give it a certain uh, import uh, uh, when we look at uh, difficult relationships such as Pakistan. General Hutter, do you want to comment on that, that same question as well? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I agree with the Ambassador Agwan. So it, I think it's been a sort of a, a, a more consistent Indian political approach that, uh, you know, we need to have peace with Pakistan. Uh, I mean, the, the revisionist sort of attitude only came from uh, only came from Pakistan side. I mean, you were quite happy with the status quo as it exists in, in, in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, 
as it exists in our relations with uh, with uh, with pakistan uh, it was only i think an attempt from the pakistani side that uh, we need to change the status quo and we need to force india to come to the negotiating table on kashmir by using you know sort of terrorism as an instrument so i i think on the indian side there has been a there has been a consistent approach that uh, you know peace with peace with pakistan uh, is in is in india's interest as a military man even along the borders i mean uh, our even our, our military approach was that if you don't have ceasefire violations we are going to be able to do our job better you can do your counter counter infiltration better you can patrol the borders in a in a much more safe way so we were always happy that you know there is there is a ceasefire agreement in place i i think the uh, should i say the trigger used to always come from the from the pakistani side and as the master agwan pointed out surely people of the country, of the two countries including those in pakistan and i have met many pakistan military uh, officers in in some of the courses that i have attended abroad i think the general feeling is that uh, you know if you could have peace it would be better uh, the attitude of the pakistan army is something that you know that that needs to sort of change but uh, agun you know the ceasefire announcement is possibly only the starting point for several other things that we are all looking forward to but i'm just wondering given your experience how the sequencing of this thing is going to play out because uh, the joint statement says that both sides will talk about things which are of core interest to them which is just code word for demo and kashmir for pakistan and terrorism as far as india is concerned this is exactly the you know sort of challenge which you know, the circle has never been sort of worked this you know we've never managed to sort of solve the problem and invariably we have these interrupting events like a terrorist attack or a you know major violation of the ceasefire and then it, you know the onus is on india to decide whether we want to continue with the talks or not so i'm just wondering is there do you think there can be a slightly different approach this time given all that we've learned from the past you know i mean to moti himself as you quite rightly pointed out has kind of done so many different things with the pakistan but do you think it's it's time for us to think about slightly different way of moving forward rather than just going around with the same uh, approach so so is that question for me uh... I was hoping that General Raghun, uh, sorry, I'm Ambassador Raghun will come in and then I'll get. Well, well, in my in my uh, in my view, you know, many of the things which have to be done are those which have been done uh, before, because you can't uh, reinvent or uh, you know create a totally new agenda or new uh, menu of options, uh, and uh, certainly given the depths to which we have. Uh, So the depths we have reached in the last three or four years on trade, on the level of diplomatic uh, representation, people-to-people contacts, etc., uh, there is a there are a number of steps which are very obviously uh, there to be uh, taken. My own sense is that we may end up doing something new, and uh, that is trying to you know craft some kind of a more uh, non-security uh, related agenda. Uh, because of the pandemic and i think uh, public health uh, cooperation in the area of public health is one uh, it's a new area and it doesn't touch any of the uh, you know the the traditional sensitive points of india pakistan uh, relations because uh, uh, in india for instance there is now a great deal of public cynicism uh, about public to pub- uh, people to people contacts or cultural uh, uh, contacts etc Uh, etc there are numerous other issues about trade and so on but public health given the present pandemic which uh, uh, which is there provides a certain opportunity to try to do something new in terms of uh, using it as a platform for beginning some uh, uh, cooperative measures and then seeing where that uh, leads to well good so uh, shrinath i think uh, i think the building blocks are in place uh, certainly uh, as ambassador raghavan's pointing uh, pointing out that you can explore new areas but see what was happening uh, you know prior to the sole sort of diplomatic impasse between the two countries you had talks going on on siachen you had talks going on on sir creek you had uh, you had military level contacts uh, on confidence building measures along the line of control uh, you had confidence building measures uh, related to Uh, people on both sides, uh, population on both sides of the line of control, which started off, uh, you know, with uh, with with trade that was happening uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, local trade, 
you had people from both sides you know coming and uh, able to meet their relatives i think some of those if uh, if it can be restarted so as i said the basics are it's not as if the basics are not in place so uh, let's restart this process uh, or start whatever is easy rather than uh, you know trying to uh, do something new uh, and uh, of course as ambassador raghavan has pointed pointing out uh, health cooperation cooperation for example in the field of environment you know this this burning of stubble is affecting populations and people on on both sides of the border these are some areas i think that uh, that we could also sort of explore with pakistan which are sort of non controversial you know don't have don't have any sort of uh, political angle to it so uh, restart the old processes look at some you know something new that that both the countries can do uh, you know that doesn't sort of raise any hackles or fears i think it's possible that the, the thing is uh, i mean are we looking at the ceasefire agreement just as in a in a short term uh, you know short framework that yes we have both the countries have immediate problems so this is what is going to fix it or we are actually genuinely sort of looking at a long term perspective of how we need to take bilateral relations forward right? i think that is uh, you know how the, how do the two countries look at this whole thing yes so we have a lot of questions coming in from our uh, viewers including those who are following us uh, on youtube uh, so indrani can i sort of direct a couple on to you so there are questions about uh, whether there might have been a role for saudi arabia in perhaps facilitating the back channel between india and pakistan or uae uh, similarly there's a question about you know what might be the sort of russian stance on india pakistan relations now that uh, you know india is seen as firmly sort of in the quad kind of uh setting as far as the indo pacific do you want to sort of take a crack at those so um yeah um well i uh, i don't know whether uh, the saudi arabia or the uae played a role in the back channel uh, it may be may have been that the uae had provided a um a nice hotel for uh indian and pakistani interlocutors to have a physical meeting uh, but uh, if the but because this if you see the saudis they eased up on their um approach to pakistan a bit uh, they've been pretty tough on the pakistanis uh, in the last couple of years and they've eased up a little bit on that so maybe give that gives them the pakistanis a little more room um about russia you know that um uh, Russia has been uh, sort of opening an a door or let's say a window to Pakistan. I don't think that I don't think they're going to stop that. I don't think uh, but the Russians will not go beyond a, per, a certain uh, level because because of the depth of the relationship with india and they don't want to endanger that any more than we want to endanger a, a russia relationship um I, i just wanted to add to what ambassador raghavan said about what could be done uh, in my view i i'd say that the government would be looking soon at uh, you know uh, a goodwill gesture like sending vaccines to pakistan um pakistan is taking uh, the astrazeneca vaccine from the covax but uh, they are uh, but you know it's a short flight from here we are giving it to people in caricom etc i see that being one of the uh, confidence building measures um my sense is that we are not going to go back to the old kind of a comprehensive dialogue or the composite dialogue that we had uh, there will be no sir creek wooler barrage um siachen talks anymore uh, because the ground situation in kashmir has changed i don't see those talks coming back in the form that we had uh, so some kind of a new dialogue may come and i my view is that it's confined to the ceasefire agreement right now because the indians want to play it very cautiously there is a public uh, disenchantment with engaging pakistan there is a for public disenchantment i don't think this government certainly wants to go against that so they ring fenced the uh, up, outreach to the at to the ceasefire and to the uh, dgmos level you notice that there is nothing on the from the political side nothing from the mea uh, and i don't 
my sense is we, I'm, it's going to be a while before that happens. Um, so I think they're, they're going to play this very cautiously. Do you think, do you share that assessment of the domestic sort of, you know, what are the boundaries within which the Indian government will have to operate? Because, I mean, call me a cynic, but, you know, uh, I, I did notice that, you know, just around the time when the ceasefire agreement has been announced, there have also been sort of press leaks saying that India prepared a Prithvi missile on the night when Aminandan was taken into custody and so on, right? So the government has a felt need to show that, you know, that we are strong, that even when we are doing these things, we are doing it from a position of strength. So, um, I mean, so, so I, I think some of that would validate what Indrani is saying, but I'd be interested to see how you read uh, the, the sort of domestic context here. So I think just two points. I think one is, you know, as, as Indrani said, I think, you know, I agree that, um, I think this is going to be cautious prudence. And I think ring-fenced is a good way of terming it. I think they will be very careful in terms of moving with Pakistan. Um, in terms of sequencing, at least from what I can make out from the outside, it certainly doesn't seem like this will necessarily lead to some kind of a multi-stage comprehensive kind of dialogue with Pakistan with a variety. One is, you know, as has been mentioned, is that the situation in Kashmir has changed. Um, but on the public sentiment, I'll say is that, you know, there's something to be said of being caught in your own rhetorical trap, which is that, you know, the rhetoric on Pakistan and for good reason, perhaps, um, given the large-scale terrorist attacks and the atrocities that have been committed since 2016, um, have been strident right? Across, especially if you look at the heartland up in North India, for instance, in most of the political campaigns, um, there is something to say that, you know, those perspectives have been kind of communicated to the public. There is a public expectation now that you will be hard on Pakistan, which I think this government has made very clear that they are. When it comes to, you know, when it comes to particular issues or responding to large-scale terrorist attacks, getting away from that and changing the public narrative um, I think will be a challenge. But as Ambassador Raghavan said, you don't become a prime minister to do small things. And hopefully the prime minister will take a call and be able to kind of buck the trend as far as the rhetorical grammar of Pakistan is concerned and essentially take a leap of faith. And hopefully that's what will break through. And I think even if that happens, you won't necessarily see a more um, kind of a sort of comprehensive dialogue kind of process, but hopefully it will lead to a longer term thinking in terms of how do you multiply effects? Um, and I'm guessing there'll be a wait and watch game. Um, I don't know, General Huda, what is the what is the time period by which you know politicians think that it is now safe to talk to Pakistan? Is it six months? Is it one year after you observe if the ceasefire incidents actually come down? And I'd, I'd be interested to know. So how do they estimate when is a good time to continue with this? So I think... Uh... I think as everyone is saying, uh, you know, you have to be cautious uh, at this stage and see how the ceasefire sort of holds. Uh, are there any major terrorist attacks? I mean, it's very difficult to uh, sort of put a time frame. Uh, when I talked about, uh, you know, that the building blocks are in place, some things are easy to do. Uh, so you stop trade, for example, uh, restart trade, restart the travel. I mean, so I, I don't think... Uh, it, it will take sort of uh, too much, uh, you know, uh, political climate to do this. These things are already being, uh, are in place. In fact, uh, it would also help ease the situation in Kashmir. It will bring some positivity amongst, amongst the people. Uh, but I, I would be very, very hesitant to put any kind of time frame and say, you know, if things uh, remain fine till about uh, four months, five months, six months, because we really don't know... Uh, <clears throat> what one incident um, you know can change so there there have been there have been numerous incidents of uh, ids and explosives uh, you know being discovered even now in in kashmir and if one of them sort of goes off and you know targets the security forces uh, convoy or something like that uh, we are going to be back to square one master raghavan this does seem to be one potential political minefield lurking out there which is the ostensible attempt or plan on the part of the Pakistan government to change the constitutional status of Gilgit Pakistan. How do you think the government of India will react to something like that? I mean, I'm asking partly because, you know, in recent times, as one of our viewers has also asked a question, the government of India has been very vocal about asserting claims to Pakistan of Kashmir. Secondly, Gilgit Pakistan is also the area where there are overlapping claims between India, Pakistan and China. And the Chinese and the Pakistanis have ostensibly settled those in the agreement of 1964, which India does not recognize. So I'm just wondering what hornet's nest lurks there 
if at all this development does happen? Well, it's difficult to say what the government will decide, but my sense is they will react in the way we have reacted so far to other constitutional changes in Pakistan uh, with regard to Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, that we don't recognize the validity uh, of these uh, uh, changes. Uh, you see, uh, once you say that the entire occupation is illegal, uh, th there is no need for you to go into details of what else has happened. And frankly, the Pakistanis have tied themselves up in knots right now over Article 370 and the JNK Legislative Assembly, etc. because till August 2019, the one thing they never gave any importance to was the JNK Legislative Assembly and Article 370. They said this was a fraud. It was a sham. And now suddenly to make this one of the centerpieces of an international campaign that statehood must be restored, Article 370 must be restored, you know, has tied their internal positions uh, into all kinds of uh, complexities to which really they should not, they now probably feel they should not have ventured in that uh, uh, direction. So my sense is that the government will say that uh, you know these are these, these are illegal uh, changes and that's that that has been the position we have always taken uh, with regard to anything to do with POK elections, constitutional changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, General Huda, one of our viewers is asking what I think is a fairly you know straightforward blunt question, which I think always hangs around these kinds of discussions, which is that I mean, is the so-called military jihadi complex in Pakistan ever going to change? I mean, they have not dismantled any of that stuff. How much should we trust the Pakistanis and actually think that there is, you know, some kind of a halfway house where we can meet beyond some kind of a ceasefire, which is a perhaps, you know, which, which you know, and as you know, ceasefire is not a, it's not a point, right? It's a process. So you know, we'll have to see how it plays out. But nevertheless, I mean, is, can we really assume that there is anything fundamentally which is shifting out here? So, I, uh, Shriyant, I don't think we can fundamentally sort of assume unless we, we see a change in practices and behavior of the Pakistan army. So, really, you really can't say that suddenly just because we have a ceasefire agreement that, you know, Pakistan is going to completely, Pakistan army is going to completely change uh, the way, uh, in, you know, and its relationships with, as you said, uh, you know, uh, with the jihadi complex. Uh, we'll have to wait and watch. As I said, I think the larger issue is... Uh, even, even in Pakistan, is there a sense that uh, what is happening with India and the way we've gone about our relationships as, since independence, is this actually achieving any strategic purpose for us? And if that kind of realization is there, then certainly you could see uh, a change in behavior. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, you please see also statements which are being given out by the army and they've said, we're not going to stop our counter-terrorist operations. We're not going to stop our counter-infiltration counter operations. So I think on, on at least on the military side and even on the political side, there is going to be wariness uh, till such time that you see uh, some of what we hope uh, is actually going to get translated in practice. But in the short term, surely, I mean, uh, to say that we'll now suddenly start trusting uh, the Pakistan army, uh, that's not going to happen. Gani, I have a two-part kind of question for you. First is, you know, uh, the Modi government also has the distinction of being the first Indian government, which is or Indian Prime Minister. Modi has spoken out on Balochistan, right? Quite explicit. Independence Day. And, you know, given Pakistan's own history of its territory being sort of broken up by the use of Indian force, you know, that is not a statement that would have gone down very lightly. So I'm just wondering, you know, what is likely to be the sort of concerns there, in, in the sense that I don't think that they are coming into this with very high levels of trust either. Uh, but the no. second thing is to say that, you know, are there other opportunities for trust building? For instance, one of our uh, viewers is asking whether the fact that India and Pakistan now have membership of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, do these provide alternate fora where we can perhaps uh, meet on the sidelines and talk in, in a way that doesn't have to necessarily put the onus on a bilateral kind of track altogether? Look, uh, the, the, for the second uh... I would agree uh, that uh, certainly we are uh, together in the SCO. Uh, there are other multilateral uh, events that we could use to speak together on the sidelines without it getting the kind of uh, uh, top billing uh, that a bilateral conversation gets. Uh, that's possible. 
I'm not saying that that's going to happen in a hurry be um, because of a large number of reasons and you've, you've enumerated a whole lot of them. Um, on the Balochistan front, yes, I think the Pakistanis would have uh, some concerns, but uh, I honestly don't see it in the same place as, say, Kashmir. I mean, they don't give it the importance that, uh, say, Kashmir has. So, I, I mean, your Akulbushan Jadav uh, supposedly stirring up trouble is one thing, uh, 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 but the kind of international campaign they did on Kashmir. Would they do one on Balochistan to say, please save Balochistan from the marauding Indians? I doubt it. Um, General Huda, there's a question which I thought you may be uh, well placed to sort of, uh, answer, which is about, you know, how do you think this ceasefire agreement is going to play out as far as China Pakistan sort of economic cooperation, particularly under the CPEC corridor, is concerned? Because uh, we refuse to accept the validity of legitimacy of the CPEC project because it undermines Indian sovereignty, uh, which is why we've kind of stood out of the whole Belt and Road kind of project, which the Chinese rolled out. Uh, but now with the ceasefire, does this mean that it will be easier for China and Pakistan to sort of carry out those things? And of course, that links all the way down to Balochistan, which is where that corridor is supposed to end. So, Srinath, uh, you know, realistically, uh, realistically looking was uh, trouble on the border and, you know, whatever ceasefire uh, engagements were going on, even some limited ones with the artillery, was it in any way directing, impacting the China-Pakistan economic corridor? And the answer is no, it, it wasn't. Uh, would we want to directly target the, the CPEC is, I think, a, a question that, uh, you know, will have to be looked at very seriously by the political leadership. So do you want to sort of... Uh, also, in some ways, uh, you know, take on the Chinese as far as as far as CPEC is concerned by direct interference in that. Does that suit your, uh, you know, foreign policy objective? Does, does that suit your national sort of uh, strategy? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, there, there would be or there was any attempt to directly uh, target the, the CPEC uh, through any sort of military means. I don't think India was considering it. Uh, maybe you have opinions, you know, from the other panelists, but uh, I don't think there was any attempt to directly sort of interfere or target with this. Ambassador Raghun, there's an interesting question here about whether this latest move on the part of India and outreach towards Pakistan in some ways also ties in with our current tenure of membership at the UN Security Council. Is India trying to sort of present a more responsible face to the world? So asked by one of our colleagues who's also a foreign diplomat. I don't think it is related to uh, the UN Security Council and our, it helping our case, uh, uh, strengthening our case to become a permanent uh, member. I think that would be a bit uh, far-fetched. Uh, I think the current uh, agreement has come about because of uh, you know, considerations which are always there in any discussion about uh, Pakistan. But at some point of time, they acquire enough uh, rolling mass and weight. Uh, and that gives a momentum, uh, especially if there's a similar view developing in Pakistan uh, at that uh, time. So I don't think one should reach out and look for uh, every possible connecting factor to explain this. As I, as I said, this is not unexpected. This is normally how, this is historically how India-Pakistan relations have uh, have behaved uh, uh, so far. So uh, I don't relate it to the UN uh, Security Council. But this point with General Huda was making about uh, CPEC, uh, uh, you know, I'd just like to say that I entirely agree with him. I think we have to draw a distinction between real substantive positions uh, and rhetorical uh, uh, positions or domestic propaganda. I think uh, one shouldn't mix up one and the uh, with the other. Uh, our objections to CPEC uh, uh, also are related to our uh, to a general sense of discomfort that China showed so little consideration for our uh, for our uh, national positions 
with regard to POK that they made CPEC into, you know, part of a larger uh, China uh, platform uh, of, the, uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative. Otherwise, the Chinese have been doing things in POK for years and years and years. And it was never such a big issue. It was really the fact that the Chinese showed so little concern for what is our stated national position. I think that's what really muddied the water, uh, the waters where CPEC is concerned. Um, maybe I could just, you know, we're running out of time. So just close with asking all of you for a quick reaction to, you know, where do you think the path ahead lies? I mean, are, are you optimistic about what we, this moment represents? Is there a possibility that we could actually build on this to gain some, make some substantial diplomatic gains? Or is this going to be more in a holding pattern uh, with us trying to say that as in, if it makes sense for both sides not to eat things up, then it's better that we sort of, you know, take what's on offer and just keep it at that level. Uh, maybe I could start with Indrani this time. Uh, so um, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm not in the optimist camp, uh, having covered too many of these. Um, I think this is... Uh, this is uh, just testing waters for the time being, uh, keeping the border calm and waiting to see how this plays out on the ground. Because as you said correctly, if there is a terror attack, if there is an IED that goes off against our security forces, all bets are off. And I think that recognition is there in the government as well. So nobody's really putting too much uh, into this, this is not. We are not into 2015. Uh, we are not in that in that mode, that optimistic mode. I don't think that's where we are. So I'd be I'd be a lot more uh, cautious about where this can go. Bajrawan, well, it's good to be uh, good to be cautious. And with Pakistan, there are so many moving parts uh, in the frame all the time that you can't really uh, say that. Uh, this is the course of action and this is what is going to be followed and we know what will happen. There are too many unpredictable uh, uh, elements. But you see, uh, I mean, the question always is of whether one is a pessimist or optimist and you know, this is just a small breakthrough and there's going to be a, a breakdown. The fact that there are cycles is well known. The real challenge for diplomacy and uh, uh, for both India and Pakistan is that when you know they are, there's a cycle and there are going to be ups and downs, what are the systems you can devise to dampen the, up, the ups and the downs? You know, how do you stabilize uh, uh, things to some extent? Because your stated positions can never be reconciled. Uh, K in Pakistan stands for Kashmir. We all know that. There is, no, there is no way those stated positions can be reconciled. The question is, can you introduce elements which will impart more stability uh, and will reduce the ups and downs so that, uh, because greater stability is something which everyone also accepts is something which is in your uh, national uh, interest for whole sets of other, uh, whole lot of other reasons. So I think that attempt possibly will be made. I don't think it will be made in the old way again. I don't think we are going to resurrect the composite dialogue in another form, but we may try some other things. But I would agree, I think the government will, you know, Take, take its time in deciding on next steps. And don't forget that Pakistan also, they have this huge uh, set of issues domestically about uh, uh, what has happened to Kashmir when you're suddenly now declaring a ceasefire and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I just I sort of uh, got disconnected. My internet went off, uh, lost the electricity. So Trinat, I'll just say just, just a line. You know, I'm optimistic. So we were probably completely at uh, the worst in bilateral relations. Diplomacy was dead. You know, all the talking was being done by guns along the border. So at least it's a, it's a positive step. Uh, as Ambassador Raghavan's brought out, you know, these there are some deep-rooted issues and how are you going to reconcile them? Are both countries going to take a little fresh approach? Uh, that is going to decide how, how things go forward. But it's certainly a, a positive step from what has been happening in the past. So I, I, I leave it at that. Right. Uh, Rudy, the last word may well be yours. Are you going to be counting ceasefire violations or looking forward to better diplomatic development? 
well hopefully we'll be out of a job and we won't need to count those uh, violations but you know just to say is that i i think you know if you if you put it i'm in the very much in the holding camp i think just two quick points i think it does well to provide some kind of relief on everything that's happened in the last month provide some kind of relief on both frontiers so that perhaps you know there'll be a little bit more focus internally on india on issues of the economy etc provide some relief in terms of thinking about larger strategic issues but second at a more humane level i think there is an opportunity here which should be um explored certainly by both sides i think indrani talked about vaccines in a, about a couple of months ago i was in a seminar with indian and pakistani scientists the top scientists in pakistan working on vaccines and you know it was it was actually heartbreaking because their basic view was that we can't even access databases from india which can help us along the way in trying to figure out the way in which we can deal with covid in places like punjab for instance where we share a border right so i think if this um break or this pause for instance at the strategic level provides a degree of a humanity expression by which way we can kind of at least look to arrest the immediate health crisis at this moment i think it can send a not only a powerful message but actually materially genuinely um just help people across the border in pakistan as indrani said i think india has done an amazing job of sending vaccines globally we should use this as an opportunity to send those in trucks across the loc and i think that will be a significant signal on a range of issues on that note rudy uh, thanks very much uh, thanks also to our distinguished panelists indrani bakhti general huda pastor raghavan it's been a wonderful discussion we ranged very widely i think we try to strike some kind of a balance between optimism and pessimism uh, we will see where realism prevails uh, and thanks to everyone else for joining in asking so many questions i'm really sorry we couldn't do justice to all the questions that kept coming which is only a testament to how much this relationship still matters to our uh, people in the subcontinent uh, so thanks so much for joining us and do please join us again uh, for the next episode of the india and the world webinar which will be on the evolving india china relations so see you all very soon thank you Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. All the best. Bye bye.